Um, I know many of you have been asking how we are going over here in the United States. Um, we're quite safe over here. Um, the state I'm in, Kentucky, I, I didn't know about this either until I moved here. But um, uh, America, you know, the map of America, um, everyone kind of knows where New York is. It's on the east side. Everyone knows LA on the west side. If you treated the United States like a dartboard and threw a dart and hit bullseye, Kentucky's kind of in the middle there somewhere. Um, so it's it's um, what's another big city? It's 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 south of um, of Chicago. Lots of people know where Chicago is, but north of uh, Dallas, so Dallas and Austin, Texas, and all that. So I'm literally in the Bible Belt. And another really cool thing about where I am is the Great Awakenings of America actually started in Kentucky, but more specifically, it actually started in the county, or think about counties that are like those, um, you know, those electoral seats that you get back home in Australia. They're kind of like those electoral seats. So uh, where I am is the actual county or electoral seat where the um, first Great Awakening started. And, um, and there's been heaps of revivals around here. Um, this is where uh, movements have been birthed. Um, um, the guy that, and we'll learn about later, but the guy that um, John Wesley sent out from England, it's kind of like a Lord of the Rings moment, the guy that was willing to go to America. Back in the day, his name was Francis Asbury. He actually landed in Georgia, came to these parts and made this his stomping ground. So a lot of history where I am speaking right from there. But that's why, that's why I really want to talk about revivals today because it's, it's such an important thing and we've got so much ground to cover. Um, I try, I'm trying to fit, you know, two or 300 years worth of history in, I don't know, an hour and, and a half. So I thought what I'd do, I'm not gonna really do it like a sermon, I'm gonna do it into three mini lectures um, because um, there is so much to go through. Um, but the thing that drove me around revivals is when I came over here to America, and I chose this institution called Asbury because I just thought, you know, it's, it sounds great. And I know it's, it's valued by lots of people in our denomination and whatnot. I had, I came to realize I had no idea about church history. I had no idea about um, Wesley. All I thought about was Methodist was, oh yeah, we sing doxology at the end, at the Chinese Methodist church. We, we do these things at annual conference everything that we do has an M in it in the acronym because that's what it is. It's, um, uh, that's about it. I didn't really know too much about it. And they keep talking about scriptural holiness all the time, but you know, do we really know what, what this is? When I say we, I'm not talking about me. I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about we as in the actual Chinese Methodist denomination. Does the world even know any of this stuff now? Later on, don't even talk about the Methodists, talk about the Presbyterians, talk about the Lutherans, talk about the, um, Anglicans, do any, does anyone know their history, which is only like literally 50, 100, 200 years ago? It's really sad because I think a lot of that rich history, and which is not history of humanity, but God's work through a lot of that history is just foregone. And we stand on the shoulders of people before us. And that's very much like the gospel message today. We, we, have, we are so, so fortunate to be part of this lineage of the gospel, which just continues on. So that's why I'm so passionate about this. And um, we're going to break it up into three types of lectures. So the first lecture that we're going to do, this is going to be the heavy one. And um, I'm going to treat you like you're all in seminaries uh, in a real rapid way. We're going to talk about church history around heritage. So we're going to understand our heritage. What is our heritage? Who are we? And we're going to talk about the Reformation, uh, which you've all heard. It sounds like this mystical idea or wars or something. Um, and that occurred in the 1500s, and we're going to push all the way through to the 1700s uh, when um, when the Great Awakening started happening. The next thing we're going to look, next mini lecture we're going to do, as if I can get through it, is um, what do we believe though? Okay, fair enough, we know our heritage, where we came from, but what what do we believe? Like, what's the difference between? Isn't just a Christian a Christian? Like, what's all this different theology? How come Luther has a view? How come? How come Calvin has a view? How come uh, is someone a heretic or not? How come Wesley has a view? Why are they all but Pentecostals have different? What's what's the go with all of this? So I want to touch a little bit. I can't do it thoroughly, but we'll touch a little bit on what do we believe from a Wesleyan perspective, or what do Wesleyans believe? Because you might not believe in the Wesleyan theology. And the third one then is because um, 
really the Wesleyan thing is, um, I don't like using the word Methodist anymore because it's not, you know, it's, it reminds me of institutions, but the Wesleyan, um, Wesleyan uh, move was really a revival. Um, back in those days, uh, it moved and transformed nations in such a rapid, accelerated and concentrated piece of time. So is that relevant for today? Uh, is everything that everything we read about history, everything that occurred in those two, three hundred years during Reformation and all the way through to John Wesley, is that relevant today? What what do we get out of it? Is just pointless books in a is just pointless stuff in a church history book? Or does does is the same God that worked back then, is he still relevant today? And does he still want revivals today? So how's that sound? We'll, we'll rip through them really quickly. I'm so glad I can just speak normal rather than having to speak like very um, slow because no one understands me back over here. I'm the, if I speak, speak too, uh, <laughs> speak too uh, fast in Australian style. All right, let's get into it. Um, part one, you ready? If you, those got notepads and everything, this mini series, this mini lecture, it's like a Korean drama, this mini um, lecture, is on understanding our heritage, okay? Korean drama, this is the part where they get all the characters. Okay, so the Chinese Methodist Church, that's what we all hear we are. Now, if, you, if I ask any of you right now, define Chinese Methodist Church, I'm pretty sure out of the three words there, people go, oh yeah, I can, I can define the word Chinese. Okay, that's great, we all know that part. Um, all of us, are, many of us will be first or second, or maybe some of us may be third generation diaspora Asians or Chinese, or maybe not. Maybe we're, um, we're passionate about the, uh, the, the ministry of uh, ministering to migrants. Some of us might be here, or some of us might be just passionate about ensuring that there's a multicultural type uh, ministry that, um, that is birthed out of all of this. But we might all know that. We'll also obviously know what church means, but what does it mean to be Methodist? What is it with all the churches that draw and hold on to these old school, archaic, traditional, feels like you're bound by chains type denominational names? It's just so frustrating. If you've thought about that, then that's like me. Um, and you're probably thinking this other question, isn't it? Why talk about, why can't you just call it the Chinese church, church, um, Christ, Jesus church? Because we're all just Christians. Why do we need to be so specific about certain heritages? Um, so you're probably wondering that it, it, Christians better than being Methodist. Methodist just is man-made thing. That's true, and uh, you're spot on if you're saying that. And we need to be careful because any any for some really humans are really good at taking moves of God and turning them into um, things without God. So we need to be careful not to have Christianity without Christ. Very important line again. We need to be careful not to have Christianity. I'm even using the word Christianity. Uh, without Christ. We need to make sure we avoid that. It doesn't matter what name we use. It, 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 it is not by Methodism that we're saved. It is not by Presbyterianism that we're saved. It's not by Pentecostalism that we're saved. It's not by uh, Church of Christ that we're saved, Baptists that we're saved. It's not by Anglicans that we're saved. It's not even by the, the non-denominational people that we be saved because I argue they're kind of like an institution anyway. Um, it's not by um, parachurch organisations like um, you know take your pick like you got the um, you got you got all these G the Jesus movement going on here Jesus culture you got uh, even back home we've, all, well, we've got the rice movement but some some of you involved in rice all of these things they're just they're they they they're in themselves they don't save only Jesus saved it is by faith in Jesus Christ alone and by accepting His message that we find um, authentic and we find a true life. So I want to get that straight right from the outset. But then if we're saying all that, should we just end it now? Like, what do we do with all this denominational stuff? Um, but the better way I like to think about denominations, let's just look at it from a distant, different perspective. Denominations, let's get our head about how man, it's mankind, humanity, uh, man, woman, how we've stuffed it up by calling it, by making denominations like an institution. Let's think of it as markers in time, in history, where there was such a significant move of God that something was birthed out of it and it had a label. That it, it was a marker in time that was such a significant move that it left an impact on global Christianity. So keep that in the back of your head. Let, let's think about it from that perspective. Okay, 
We're going to go into our history books. I'm going to throw you lots of names in this Korean drama. Sorry for the blokes that watch, don't watch Korean drama and the sisters that don't watch Korean drama. You might, I don't know, the sports team. Let's, we're going through the sports players, the Hall of Fame. Um, so we're going to start the Reformation. We've heard a lot about this. In, um, only a few years ago did we celebrate the, the, um, the 500 year anniversary of the Reformation. So it commenced back, 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 back in the, fifth, um, um, in the uh, end of the 15th century going into, the, going into the 16th century. So, you know, clearly none of us were born. But what was going on at that time? There was no denominations back then. You're probably thinking, whoa, that's great, no denominations. There was only the papal church, the Catholic church. Papal meaning there's a pope over it. And uh, what ultimately happens with every single move, like I mentioned earlier, is if there's a person positioned in power, let's say they were doing great for the Lord, but their mind always gets in the way and um, we have a great habit of mucking it up and making it more for man rather than for the Lord. And that's what the state of the Catholic Church at this stage, uh, at the end of the 15th century, the church was just corrupt. It was huge. Um, it was all across the, um, the then, then at the end of its life, Roman Empire, and it was just, the church was just massive. It was everywhere. But it was just corrupt. There was dodgy teaching going on. There was serious... Uh, moral issues going on within the church that it was leading lots of people that were governed by the church, the Catholic church that was just discontent, that they had heaps of unrest in their societies. It was so, it was so bad that um, at, the, at the time, the, the official Bible that many of them used was this thing called the Vulgate. It was a Latin Bible, but hardly anyone could speak Latin. It's like if they made the official Bible, like, you know, Mandarin, and then, I don't know, I, don't, I can't speak Mandarin, but then, like, we're forced to, imagine having those, like, translation earphones or whatever, you can't, it's so hard. Um, they were doing services in Latin, people couldn't understand it, and then they, they were selling, they were even selling things that which they called indulgences, that they could say, this will help forgive your sins. So it was clearly taking abuse out of um, the church. Um, they refused giving communion to some lay people. Um, you even had the, the leaders, like people in authority in the church, popes and whatnot, they were having affairs. They were having love children to hide the love children. They're putting them in monasteries and uh, it was just no good. These people took vows of celibacy, remember. There was, um, there was people doing, well, they were doing building funds back then, right? We all know a good building fund happens a lot in churches nowadays. They were doing a good building fund. And uh, what they were doing with it was they'll sell excess goods to, they were just making up building funds so they can just use all the funds out of this to, to fund their wealth, their prestige, their princely royal type um, lives, these, these leaders in the church, the Pope, the Pope, the, um, the bishops and whatnot. And they loved these titles of being a bishop because if they could be a bishop, then that means um, what they would do is they would, they would basically have, um, get all the offerings and whatnot off certain counties, but they hardly talked to them. So they were just, they wanted these counties or these regions because they would just get more money to fuel their life. So it was, it was very bad. And the Catholic, um, another thing that happened at the time was their theology and their teaching was a little bit astray. So they taught um, uh, that justification was gradual, but then you could, um, you could accelerate it through and, and the forgiveness of sins through some of these things like indulgences. That There was this thing called simony. I'm not sure whether you've heard the word simony before. It's like this word simony actually is taken from, um, there's that character in the Bible, Simon, who tries to buy, you know, in Acts, he tries to, Try, try, tries to buy the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't do that. So that's what they call uh, simony when you try to buy stuff. They, they try to foster that within the church to, for economic reasons. So it became a market, basically. You can imagine Jesus going through and knocking everything out like what, what, he, did, what he did in the Gospels. Um, and that's not what you should do. They also, and this is still held today, but Catholics hold a tradition, tradition that um, a lot of the, uh, what we call them as sacraments, like baptism and whatnot, they're very important. They're actually um, necessary for salvation. So they, they developed this um, habitual type grace towards sacraments. They had this heavy culture of penance, um, recompensating to yourself towards salvation. And, 
and this was just getting way out of hand. Um, there's this great historian called Madeline Gray, and um, she said that it, it just reached this situation uh, at the time where the remission of your penalties of sin was for sale to the highest bidder. It's like an auction. You want more forgiveness of sin? Here's an auction for this, and you can, you can get your forgiveness of sins done. So very corrupt. At the same time during that era, there was increasing nationalistic pride, kind of like today a little bit, uh, you know, right where I am, make America great again and whatnot. There was so much nationalistic pride. And the reason why they were getting proud for because the Catholic Church and the, um, at the time, which was huge, it had this view that there would be one flock under one shepherd, which is the Pope. And um, the, this, this shepherd would just run all the land, but they had power back then as well. They had armies with them. They would use it to knock out and, and suppress and um, even uh, put to death some heretics who, who they deemed to be heretics. So um, people were getting fleeced, people were getting punished, and obviously nationalistic pride was then growing. And obviously they couldn't even understand the language of Latin half of them anyway. So lots of nationalism. The other thing that was going on, and believe it or not, because we need to go there, was there was torturing going on within the church. And I touched on heretical views, but really, let's say it another way, anyone that was against the church, they would punish. And um, the Catholic Church introduced waterboarding. You know, we see that, we see that um, uh, criminalised today, waterboarding, in, in the modern contemporary era, even amongst countries when they go in to have wars. It was used to preserve power. It was used to knock out uh, opposition from things that smelt like the Reformation, um, to knock out people and classify them as heretics, not martyrs. Famous ones during that time were um, uh, John Wycliffe. Everyone had heard of John Wycliffe. He wanted to translate the Latin Vulgate into English in the, in, in the 1300s or so. He was deemed, um, he, was, he was put to death, he was deemed heretic. There was other guy called John Huss, um, where he had these followers called Hussites come out of him, and we'll hear about him later uh, with the Moravians. He was from Bohemia, and he spoke um, publicly uh, about the necessity for the laity to have access to gospels. Not, we do with that today. What's wrong with that? Um, why, why is it bad for us to learn the word as, as God's people? So John Hussey was put to death. He also was pretty, pretty brave because he stood up against the, um, <laughs> against the corrupt church at the time. And these people were very much their heroes for our main character in this instance, this bloke called Martin Luther. This guy's a young German monk. He's a friar. He's one of the search for God. He decides to go to a monastery. You know, this guy's studious. He's, he's, um, he's a bull at the gate. He's like a real strong character type. And um, he, he just wanted to know God, but he just got so frustrated with it. He was, he was, everything that he was learning about within the church, church didn't seem to reconcile with what he was learning in the Bible. Um, and this guy made an impact. But you can see there was kindling placed on this, to set up this fire by the likes of John Wycliffe, John Haas, all these others that were willing and bold enough to speak up against the church and corruption. Yes, there were true heretics at the time, but there was legit people that were speaking up. They were laying kindling down for this fire and God used Martin Luther like a spark, really, to set this off. Uh, and I really want to enforce this point because it's not Martin Luther's reformation in Germany. It is, um, yes, he's triggered something, but God laid, used all these people to, to, to effectively... Um, put the foundations in place, the environment in place for something to occur, to, to reform the church, to revive the church, to bring it more in line with what his kingdom is. Um, this great this historian that I love reading, Roger Olson, he states that Martin Luther, he, he breathes new life into Western Christianity. Um, he revolutionised it. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an upgrade. It was a full revolution. Um, so this guy, as I mentioned, he was just, he was in a, he was in a uh, monastery. Um, he was searching for God so much that he even went into mysticism. He read a lot of the mystical works of the, there's these guys that were called the desert fathers. They went out to the deserts because they were searching for God and they wanted to be in isolation and contemplation. But 
he tried to study their works to learn more about God, but he, he, whilst he would learn about God in his head, he just didn't feel liberated by God's love. He found it really hard to love God. We, we, we all know this feeling. Some of us may be feeling that feeling even now. And, and he, he, but then he would look at the history books and see these guys that were deemed heretics like Wycliffe and John Huss. And he goes, man, I kind of agree with what they were saying, but then am I a heretic? Do I need to be put to death? These guys, um, I kind of agree with the Look at the passion that's coming up through their words. Is, is something going on here? I, I, am I wrong, God? What's going on? And Martin Luther then, he fast forward to the point where in 1517, he, he had enough of it. Um, he's, he's, he's actually went and gone to the, um, gone to Rome and other areas. And he's just, he saw all this, um, simony in place, indulgences, the corruption first turn, and he was just over it. He felt so conflicted. 1517, he's this German fella. He goes up to Wittenberg Castle. He, he writes down like these 95, like arguments against the church and he just, frustration, he just nails it on the door. Not the much of it, right? Lots of people have complained in the past, but this girl's passionate, wrote, wrote some thesis, some arguments, and placed it on the wall. And that just kick-started something that could not be contained. It sparked a reaction that, that just travelled, not from Germany, but it just went everywhere. Um, and Luther thought he was going to end up in the same boat as Wycliffe and Haas. He thought he was going to just get, you know, burn at the stake, being a heretic. But amazingly, God just sent people to um, protect him at that time. Even though Luther, to be honest, he, some, he's a pretty profane guy with his language. He's going to be pretty um, crude, very um, rough, um, you know, medieval form of swearing. He's, he's not a, didn't sound like a pleasant guy. Um, but God used him and this stubbornness that he had um, to do a lot of this and send people to protect him. He had people like that were the, um, uh, that were the officials of massive towns to basically put him in hiding. Uh, so protected him from put, being placed in the same position as John Huss and these other martyrs. What were the things that he argued about? So the three things that he stood really, really heavy upon were, uh, you, a lot of us heard this, justification by grace through faith alone. I'll repeat that again justification by grace through faith alone remember at the time there was so much emphasis on buying your way to salvation or the papal authority they can say stuff and then it's like god but um what luther argued was that we can only be justified we can only be saved by god's grace and faith that's it end of story and we've got a lot to thank him for that the second big thing he pressed on was this concept called priesthood of believers. Well, what is priesthood of believers? Well, at the time, they thought that um, the, um, uh, back in that Catholic church day, they believed that only the priests could really have access to God. That's it. No one else. And they, they were like the brokers between God and the people. And Luther was like, no, from what I study, what I read in the word, it was that we are all priests through the high priest of Jesus Christ. And we read that in Hebrews, it's in the Bible. And the third big thing he touched on was this whole view about the sacraments. Now, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, sacraments were used, but they profited from them. And um, they introduced more and more of these sacraments, really mainly for economic market reasons. But what a sacrament really is, it should be a um, observable uh, grace, like an observable divine grace. What's an example of baptism? Um, and when we have Holy Communion or Eucharist, it's something, it's a grace that's been instituted by Jesus Christ and then entrusted to the church to carry out. Um, the Catholic Church emphasised that this was needed for salvation slash economic reasons, bolstered it up, took, took advantage of it. Now, out of, this, um, out of this frustration from Luther sparked what we call the Reformation, which led to the birth of the Protestants. So Catholics were only the only church back then 
And now you had this group called the Protestants. Now this is a big umbrella term. Really all it means is to be protesters. Pro protest, protestant, protestant. To be Protestant means you protest basically against the church. So this came about. So in Germany, you had Martin Luther. He was one of the protesters there. And a group of people came out of that called the Lutherans, which still exists to this day, one group of protesters. And they had, um, you know, they, 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 were, they were very still quite formal, still very liturgical. They had a very mystical view of the sacraments. Um, one of the things that the Catholic Church believed at the time was this really technical scientific term. Probably they used it so no one could understand it, but it was like consubstantiation, long term. Um, but what it really, what they believed was that you could, um, Jesus' blood and um, when you take the Holy Communion, Jesus' blood and uh, the, the wine actually turns into Jesus' blood and the, um, and the bread actually turns into his flesh by uh, by this um, by this you know metaphysical means and luther luther was a little bit close to that um and i won't get into the technicality of it but he he had also a mystical view not exactly the same he disagreed with it but he had a similarish view um that there was a very um sacrilegious element associated with these these elements he also with all of these things that he pushed on um, and his views that he had, the Lutheran church pretty much broke off from the Catholic church in Germany and became its own group of people. But in another part of Europe, really it was orchestrated by God. There were these fellas in Switzerland and there was this guy called, I love his name, Ulrich Zwingli. He was going around Switzerland and he was, he was having the same thoughts and views about the Catholic Church as Martin Luther. And he was kicking up a fuss. He was protesting. He was, um, he, was, he was raising a movement right there in Switzerland. His successor was someone that you might have heard of called John Calvin, a lot more famous. Because this guy was just an administration beast. He, he was just, uh, um, you know, he probably could run a, a, a top top ASX company today. This guy was just, he, just, he was just a machine at managing and administering things. So he was the more famous successor of the Swiss movement. And in the Swiss Reformation, or the, sorry, the Swiss Protestant movement, the protesters in Switzerland, they became known, to, they became known as the reformed movement. See, when you hear people talk about the reform tradition, the reform this, it really stems from Calvin and Zwingli back in those days. They were a little bit different to Luther, who was up in Germany, because they, um, um, and they had a big fight about this Zwingli and, Zwingli and Luther, but they, they um, uh, Zwingli believed that, you know, this Holy Communion stuff, it's great, we need to celebrate it, but the main thing should be the sermon. And the communion kind of gets in the way a little bit, so let's, we shouldn't celebrate it too much. Um, we should, you know, we should not detract from the word. And the the holy communion really is a memorial. There's nothing like mystical about it. It's, we just eat bread, drink wine, and hey, it, we just remember Jesus. That's 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 what it's meant to be. So he had a more memorial type view of the holy communion. This caused massive friction between uh, Martin Luther and his um, and his Swiss mates that they kind of. They had their own groups. They, was, they all agreed on most of everything that they were protesting about, except on a couple of things like this. So out came the reform movement. Related to the reform movement, that, well, there was another reformer. His name, he's from Scotland, and his name was John Knox. And he was pretty much like the Scottish version of the, um, uh, Scottish version of the Swiss guys. And he was very enthused by the Swiss guys. And he made the Presbyterians. So you might have heard of them. There's still a lot of them back home in Australia. And then something that's a lot, we're getting closer to home now to uh, where we are, where do we sit, where does the Wesleyan side sit? Um, there was a guy in England um, when during the English Reformation, um, they had few, they had like, imagine the, um, uh, what's it in Australia, the Liberal Party and the Labour Party. Imagine that. Imagine there was, there was one side that was, that was pro-Catholic and one side that was pro um pro-Protestant. So they would, 
they would go back and forth, back and forth. There'll be fights, wars, killings, persecutions. Uh, but to swap those two parties for like different kings and queens, right? So they're knocking each other out. Eventually, there was this guy that came about. His name was Thomas Cranmer. You might have heard of this thing called the Common Book of Prayer. If you go into an Anglican church or school, he basically, you know, initiated a lot of that stuff. And he said, okay, rather than going Catholic and Protestant, we're going to go right in the middle. We're going to have this middle ground thing called Anglicans, Anglicanism. Uh, So that's how the Anglican church was birthed. It was really like uh, one of the good bits of Catholicism what are the good bits about Protestantism and let's whack them together. And even what are some of the good bits from like the Eastern Orthodox church? Then you even had people that were protesting against the protesters. So protesters of the Protestants. And then these guys, they were called the Anabaptists. Uh, you, you don't really see that anymore. See the Baptists now, kind of similar, but they were deemed radicals back then. And they, they believe that, you know, People that went into the church, like the Catholics and the Protestants, they weren't really Christians. So we need to re-baptize everyone. Because they were re-baptizing everyone, they were, they were viewed really bad by a lot of the other churches, Catholic or Protestant. And, um, and uh, they believe that repentance was more important than getting baptized. One of the most famous things about Anabaptists is that they were pacifists. They never went into, they, they, they never um, uh, went into wars and stuff. So they just kind of, you, you want to, and there was, you remember the Catholic Church had, had, had people that could fight and there was governments and everything. So these Anabaptists, they copped a lot of flack, unfortunately. So that's, the, that's really the lay of the land. Even within the Catholic Church itself, they had Reformation. So because of everything that was going on, actually not because of everything that was going on, the Catholic Church was so big, it was getting corrupt globally. But there was, um, there was certain pockets like in Spain, uh, um, in Spain, they started a reformation. Queen Isabella, she was there. She started a reformation. was called the, um, for the Lord of the Rings fans, this history. Her husband was called King of Aragon. <laughs> so, there was a King of Aragon. Um, and they sought about uh, reforming the Catholic Church in Spain. But it wasn't enough to get the, um, the popes excited at the time. So the corruption still continued. But, that, but then when the Protestant Reformation happened, um, then they really took note. And the Catholic Church said, look, we're, we're basically going to die because everyone's going to leave us. We need to reform ourselves. And some of them internal within the Catholic Church are saying, yeah, yeah, we're, we've been corrupt. We need to admit that we're corrupt and turn back to our roots. So you had a lot of these legends that came out during that time within the Catholic Church. There's schools, I'm pretty sure there's schools around most of Australia, like those Catholic schools, some of them called um, uh, St. Ignatius. So St. Ignatius was one of the beastie people during the um, Catholic Reformation. He was like this army guy, military guy, but then he got knocked out because of some physical, physical limitation. So was, he, he knew how to govern, militarise people. He ended up wanting to be a monk after a spiritual encounter and he went out there and then he lived counter to the, um, to the corrupt Catholic Church. He started getting into... Um, monastic, being a monk, living in poverty, being very socially minded. I think Mother Teresa, right? Except with a military background. And they all used like a weapon by the Catholic Church because wherever there was a need, they would send St. Ignatius and his order, which was court. You might have heard this as well, the Jesuits, the Jesuit priests. So they went out there everywhere and they're like, um, they like army of Mother Teresa. So they'll bring up a lot of goodwill for the Catholic Church. And they had all these big councils and stuff. There was one called the Council of Trent, which was really well-renowned in the Catholic Church. If you've got any Catholic friends, raise that with them. They'll know about it for sure. But, you know, the, Cat- the Council of Trent is known as um, the place where uh, the reformation of the Catholic Church really happened. So internally within the Catholic Church itself. And they affirmed doctrines and positions. And, um, and, uh, they- and one of the differences that they had to the Protestants is that, remember I was talking about how um, uh, the Protestants just said scripture, scripture alone. But um, the Catholics also said, well, yeah, we agree with that, but we also believe um, tradition is very important because there's some things that were passed down from, you know, all the way when the church was started with Peter and James and as things were just verbally passed down. They believe there was a traditional aspect that needed to be, um, to, to be honoured as well. 
So a little bit different to the Protestants there. And they also had a very, um, what, this techni- we love technical words in church church language, eh? like ecclesial, very, very structural stuff about the church. They've got popes and bishops and all that stuff. Whereas some of the Protestants, they didn't like that stuff. Some of them, they didn't mind it. So some of them still have bishops, some of them don't. So it can be seen, we'll pause for a little bit and uh, uh, um, now we can see that the Protestant Reformation made massive impact in history. It's, um, in fact, it's, it bridges more than just um, our faith. There was massive changes there that, that influenced the way we live today, like with um, um, the capitalism that came out of it and, uh, and it's like more democratic thought, all of this stuff. At its core, though, it was a religious mo- movement that was reacting to a corrupt Catholic church. So it might sound a little bit disheartening. Oh, man, there's all these people like Martin Luther, but I didn't know there was multiple versions of them. Yeah, they're all in different countries. And it, while they were splintering away from each other, they did agree on what we can call the five solas, okay? Um, it is Latin. Sola Scriptura. If you've got your pen, first one, they all agree on sola scriptura, which is scripture alone. Um, scripture is the authority. They can agree on the second one, which is sole fide, which is faith alone. We can only be justified by faith, faith, faith alone, no works. The third one was sola gratia, um, by grace alone, but only through God's grace can this happen. Um, the fourth sola, sola Christus. This only comes through Christ alone. So um, the, the solar, you can probably figure out, means alone. And then the last one, and this was the tagline from a school up in Sydney, Trinity Grammar, was um, uh, Deitor Gloria Soli Deo. So Soli Deo Gloria. Glory only is given to God alone. So those things the Protestants all agreed on, even though they had like little differences here and there. And they, you know, they had the Lutherans, the Baptist, Anabaptist, the Reformed, Presbyterians, all these guys, they all agreed on really the five solas. So I might take one, two questions. Uh, um, maybe I'll just go if there is any. Otherwise, I'll just keep racing on, conscious of time. Any? Okay, let's keep racing. I'm going to, I'm only up to, I'm not even up to Wesley yet. <laughs> so, I think, I, this think is really, uh, I do have a question. Rob. I'll have a question. Yeah, go, mate. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, does the Catholic Church still practice um, salvation based on works today? So they, they, um, they have, um, they believe that there are things that you need to do. So a lot of these sacraments that you need to do if you're, if you're a Christian. They also, um, they softened a lot on a lot of this stuff. They're very big on holy living, though which we're about to get to in the next part. So they said, yes, justification by, um, uh, by faith, but you also need to be justified through like holy living. Um, they saw that as two sides of the same equation of salvation. Um, so not, not works directly per se, but they wanted to see it expressed. Second question as a follow-up, uh, how then should we best, I guess, evangelize to Catholic friends or Catholic people. Yeah. I think it's very important to note that um, uh, the word Catholic is such an umbrella term nowadays. Mm. And um, there are some Catholic uh, groups that are um, very mer- meritous based, uh, very works based. Then there are, which, you know, they, they verge heavily. It, it really questions things like faith alone. Um, and they also, lots of them are really into the um, good, very close to uh, idolization of, of what they deem as saints. Um, now, but at the same time, there are a lot of Catholics that believe, look, let's pull away the terms, right? Um, a lot of Catholics that believe in Jesus as their saviour. So... I think we need to be careful when we evangelise um, to certain people and not, not come up with an assumption um, about their faith based on their title. Look, some of us, it might even be a Protestant denomination and we might think, oh, they'll be Christian already because they're Baptist. Well, maybe not because doesn't, the label doesn't give you the, the, 
it doesn't mean that you're Christian. And we, it's, we can't judge either. I want to really err us from judging them on the side to potentially evangelize. But I think the most important thing is to love in those instances and see how we go. But it is a complex thing. I wish we'd done another time, but the, our Catholicism has evolved. Um, but it's a lot more, the Protestants and the Catholics are a lot closer together they are now than they were back in, back in time. Okay, thanks, Rob. No worries, mate. Anyway, we should get going. Now, remember at the start when I was talking about every move of man, every, sorry, move of God ends up being um, uh, idolised as a move of man and it gets institutionalised and just, just we're great at doing that as humanity. It's no good. So in the years post the Reformation, <laughs> uh, all these battles are going on, right? You got the Lutherans in Germany going, we, it is this, <laughs> the finer detail, right? And then you got the, um, the, the reform guys in Switzerland going, no, it is this. And then you got the Anglicans going, no, we're in the middle. And then you got the Baptists don't want to fight, just, you know, just get killed and stuff. But there was, then lots of people were investing then in, whoa, knowledge is power. Let's study the word more and uh, let's define uh, doctrines even more so I can win these debates. Kind of sounds a little bit like the church today in some ways. Eh? So in the years post-Reformation, there was some, some, starting to see some really strong hardline orthodoxy emerge in all the divergent streams of Protestant, Protestantism. So many big words when you go into church history, man. And they start arguing with each other, start studying, getting into this thing. We call this like this obsession with study, like they're getting into scholasticism. They're like, you know, Asians doing Kumon and stuff. They were really getting into it and getting, getting very rationalist and philosophical and they're criticizing each other. And um, it led to the, um, the, let's just pick on one group, the Lutherans, they were being described um, after, you know, 100 years or so. Great. We changed the architecture. Corruption got called, named and shamed, and we split away from them. Um, but then all this scholasticism and this, um, this knowledge stuff was coming through. We got into a state of spiritual, moral, and theological, I love this word, lethargy. Spiritual, moral, and theological lethargy. Sounds like the Pharisees, doesn't it? So they started getting very lethargic in the stuff, high and dry to the high almighty and all their, all the things they're kind of calling out the Catholic church on, but they weren't indulging it. They're trying to live it now. So not, not, not profiteering from the, the wealth, like the Catholic church when it was corrupt, but now they're profiting from being morally right and having the best debates and knowing the most. Out of this, you can call it another like Reformation 2.0. There was this group of people that came up called the Pietists, piety. And they thought, they were in Germany, they thought, oh, this thing Luther was on, the Reformation, it's kind of incomplete because, you know, Luther was really into like the mystical stuff and, you know, we know he was very influenced by some of those, her those people that were deemed heretics, but were not. They're like martyrs like John Huss and Wycliffe. And you know, these guys had, they, were, they really lived it in their heart. And rather than just reforming doctrines all the time, I think we need to like reform our own lives, guys. So there was these pietists that um, came, out, came out. And um, whilst they kind of influenced a lot of these uh, these these Protestant movements to be more focused on pious living. And they, they were calling out that it's not just all in your head, that there's elements that you need to be able to live out through your life. It needs to come, you know, you really need to love God. It really came to the fore in um, the late 1600s. There was this, um, they got great <laughs> European names. Hey, thankfully Reformation wasn't in Asia. Hey, it'll be, Really tough saying all those Cantonese <laughs> Mandarin names. Anyway, these, these ones are tough as well. This guy's name was called Philip Jacob Spenner. And he wrote this famous, famous book called uh, Pia Desideria. It just basically means pious desires, to have desires for piety. You remember the Reformation guys, Protestants guys were so scared of piety because they thought that 
the Catholic Church was indulging from pious living, yeah, that they'll make profiteering from piety, like acts of piety. But then um, this, but then we swung so hard that it just became like this head thing. And then now, um, uh, uh, Jacob Spenner and Pierce Desires and all the pietists, they were saying, well, Luther really was like that as well, but he probably didn't have the time to get into it. But there's, um, that's like why they thought it was like the Reformation 2.0. We need to focus on Reformation within our hearts as well. Just don't focus on church structures and doctrine, but we need to focus on the inner transformation. And um, one of the things that we can quote from this book, Pious Desires, is it says that, quote, our whole Christian religion consists of the inner man or the new man, the soul is faith and whose expressions are the fruits of life. What a great quote. And one of its biggest contributions was its emphasis not just on priests and clergy to be educated in the world, in, in, in the word of God, but also the laity. Kind of sounds like that Hus guy that we're talking about earlier. And they also started something very big then because they said, hey, we need not just the priests to know about the word of God, we need all the laity to know about it as well. And they think, oh, how are the laity going to learn about it? They don't, go to, they don't go to monasteries and stuff. And then these pious people go, hey, let's, um, let's set up little colleges, guys. We'll call them colleges of party. So they're basically just small groups. And they got in these little tiny small groups and started Bible study. And they, because not everyone was super educated back then, so that's small groups and like a leader and stuff. And they'll, they'll credit to enable the whole church to grow in faith. And this got a lot of opposition from the Orthodox Lutherans at the time. So it goes to show that, again, reinforcing that point, whatever man seems to um, be a, a vehicle instrument of for the Lord, it ends up being corrupt again because man just can't help themselves from corrupting things. So, um, and it's this, but this thing started to spread everywhere. And it was, he also had this groundbreaking suggestion that, hey, you know, pastors, um, rather than just preaching and doing the sacraments, I think pastors should also be focused on being, being focused on the faith maturity of our congregations. It doesn't sound like new stuff today, but back then it was pretty groundbreaking. He called it, I love this little play on words. He called it the inculceration of heart Christianity. So the installing, the installation of heart Christianity that the pastors needed to be focused on, which would lead to personal holiness. So you know how we always think about like, oh yeah, hang on, I thought Wesley came up with small groups. No, it wasn't Wesley. It was like this pious movement that was driving it. Um, and this whole focus on personal holiness was driven through the pietists. And it rolled out through all of those countries that experienced Reformation. The other big thing that the pietists started to contribute because that um, they were saying, hey, well, because we're doing all this study of the word now, we're like, man, I think we need to do stuff rather than just focus on the structures of the church and everything and doctrine. Um, maybe we should reach unreached people. So these pietists started sending out, they, they, they started doing Protestant missions and they, they even sent out teams to India. Um, whilst the Orthodox Church was fighting over doctrine and whether the, a word should be here or there, they were, they were putting it into practice and they started orphanages with the poor needs. They went out to all around the place. In fact, some of you might have read some very famous pietist type works um, that are still around. Um, what's his name? Uh, My Utmost for His Highest. You guys know that book? By Oswald Chambers, I think get it at Kurong and stuff. Uh, that's uh, that's very pietistic. Um, so you know, still around the place. Okay, now we get to the stage of England. Isn't it cool how you see oh, all these names that I see around churches actually have some meaning? But unfortunately, I think lots of us forget that stuff. Um, what was happening in England? Now England at this time. Let's fast forward now to the 1700s stage is set everyone knows charles dickens he said it was the best of times it was the worst of times it was the age of wisdom it was the age of foolishness it was the epic of belief so this captured this era england was basically on the you know there was the global power it was rising up quick and there was this big thing going on around the world at that time it was called the Industrial Revolution. 
there was massive economic benefit to that. People were coming in from working as farmers and they were basically coming in being cogs, you know, getting specialised in certain industries and doing stuff. As um, machinery started to come around, massive economic benefit was coming through to the lands due to capitalism. But because of that, there was massive cost as well. Like the world didn't know to handle and didn't know how to handle industrialization, the industrial revolution. The gap between rich and poor went insane. It um, grew dramatically. It poverty went through the roof, but at the same time, rich people went through the roof. Cities started being born and getting massively overcrowded. There was all these um, just bad things that we know of today that were being born. Then you sort of seeing like. Um, gin was cheap alcohol was going on people getting addicted to alcohol now that money sex industries were sprouting in ghettos there was um there was viruses coming around because of all this this engagement of people smallpox came around was plaguing people it killed like you know four hundred thousand people a year in europe just on its own right there was Morality was just declining crazy. The church was so inward, was getting more and more inward focused. And there was, and in England, the Anglicans, um, they, were, they were getting tired from doing stuff because they, they'd gone through so many internal wars and civil war between Catholics and Protestants. Um, uh, what's, um, everyone's heard of Bloody Mary, I think. Um, it's not a drink. It's Bloody Mary is... Um, Queen of England at the time, she was known as Bloody Mary because she killed a lot of Protestants when she, she believed in the Catholic end when she came to power. So he went to and forth, back and forth all the time, and people were getting lethargic with this. The church was getting lethargic. Um, more so, the church was getting so irrelevant um, because many of the poor people, the criminals, drunks, they weren't being accepted into the church. And despite the um, church doctrines being like right now, and you didn't have people doing really corrupt stuff and profiteering from church, it started to get so focused on the head um, that it became irrelevant to so many people. You know, these church people would use all these complex doctrines and to the poor person or to the uneducated, it didn't mean anything. Like Christianity is for the elite. And it happened again in Germany as well. Um, I like what happened in Germany. Everything was just getting too, too way too orthodox, and uh, church groups arose that were that were against this very liturgical style, the ceremonial nature of church, the complexity of church. They wanted to hear the word rather than just hear all this complex stuff. So in England, right in the midst of this, you start to see some groups start up. One was a political group. One was called the Puritans. So this is the Puritan group. And like a, this, this, it was really like a group of churches that came together and said, Where we, we remember what happened in Europe when the Reformation happened, especially in Switzerland with John Calvin. And um, you, we, we believe in that, that change. And we think that, Angl remember Anglicanism was like in the middle of Catholicism and Protestantism. The Puritans said, you know, we need to be more congregational in the way we do things. Uh, uh, more lay people focused and more self-governing uh, rather than the Anglican system, which had still had, um, you know, still got it today, right? Like the, uh, what's his name? Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, they had archbishops and stuff. So they were pushing that agenda. Very famous Puritan um, uh, in America. It's the Prince of Puritans, Jonathan Edwards. Uh, he's a great you should read his stuff. Amazing. He was involved in the Great Awakening. We won't focus on him today, but he was a Puritan. They moved over to North America, the Puritans. And then another group started. Uh, this group called the Methodists. England was going downhill massive and the Anglican Church was pushing um, against these Puritan groups that were being set up that were a little bit anti-Anglican. And this Anglican minister called John Wesley, he got, he was raised in the Anglican tradition, which is like the middle way between Catholicism and Protestantism. But then he combined it with this pious type learnings that he got from, the, that he, he got influenced by. And revival fire started coming through England. 
but he didn't want to leave the Church of England, the Anglican Church. He tried to do it as an England Anglican minister, like a parachurch organisation. He tried to push along the way. So that's where the Methodist thing sits. Let's do a quick time check. Okay, 7.30. Oh, 7.30 my time, sorry. Wherever you are, you've got a bit of time left. A little bit about John Wesley. Let's touch on him. This guy was... Um, this guy was beast mode, uh, he, like Luther-esque. Um, John Wesley, his mum, she was probably more beasty. She had 19 kids, right? <laughs> um, yes, it's 7.30 in Perth, but just split the AM to PM. John Wesley's mum was more beasty. She had 19 children. So like, let's, I've, like, I've got uh, four. No, how many do I have? I can't keep counting them. I've got two. I've got four. That's a lot already. It's more, when he gets more than a sedan, it's a lot. So uh, she had 19 sided. You need a lot of Kia, Kia carnivals for that. But um, uh, she, um, 19 children, unfortunately, a few of them died. But John Wesley, obviously then, he grew up in a very myth methodical household. His mum was done to it, right? Uh, she had to have a system in place to manage that many kids, right? I've got only four and we need a system in place. Um, she homeschooled all of them as well. Like she's beast mode. Um, but they noticed that this kid, he was a special kid when he was young age because there was this house fire in the Wesley household. Everyone escaped. John Wesley's a little kid stuck up there and um, they thought he was going to die. But amazingly out of nowhere, these rescuers came and they, they in the lines of Zechariah 3.2, they, he was plucked from the fire, a brand plucked from the fire. Um, and they knew something was special about this kid then. Like, why was he saved from the fire? He was smart. He was trained at Oxford University. Um, he was a natural leader. And like Calvin, he was just an administration beast. Like he could, um, he just knew how to run things. He was good at that stuff. He knew how to, um, he was not, not only good at, um, influencing and raising an uh, army of people, but he was very good at putting structures in place to make a move. Um, at, when he was at Oxford Uni, remember this is the time when were, everything was, it was very head knowledge. Um, and, and at the University of Oxford, he and his mates, his, his brother Charles, he had this um, super um, evangelist preacher guy, mate, that was called George Whitfield, a like, super good preacher guy. And they decided to make a small group, you know, they're kind of influenced by some of this pious stuff they were reading that was happening elsewhere in Europe. And they said, but they were full on. They were like, man, let's meet three hours every day. Let's encourage one another. Let's pray. And um, they were into it. And let's do prison ministry. Let's study the Bible. And because they were really methodical about the way they did stuff, you can argue, you know, up to you to think whether it was too methodical or not. They were teased. They were bullied. Everyone in Oxford you used to go around and go, look at those fellas. They're, uh, they're like the holy club. That's super methodical. Let's call them the Methodists because they're, uh, they're just too into structure. Why aren't they, they don't want to play basketball with us. What's, what a bunch of holy freaks. They were just teased nonstop. And uh, no one really liked hanging out with them. Eventually, um, the group grew a little bit and John Wesley became a bit of the leader of the group because he was just like a beast. Uh, and he had leadership traits. Um, and he was clearly smart. He had the Oxford mind. He knew all the word. He knew all the doctrines. Sounds familiar to Europe, broader Europe, didn't it? But he lacked something in his heart. He just lacked the convictions in his soul. So he goes off on some mission trip to America because he's trying to fill it with like experiences, do religious things. And he goes on a mission trip after training at Oxford. And um, it's, he stuffed it up, didn't really do too well. He got into romantic relationships and, you know, he was just, it didn't go too well at all. Um, but he encountered some piet pietistic people at the time. Remember that John Huss guy we were talking about before? He met some, this group of people called the Moravians that were Hussites. Like they followed the um, John Huss model of like small groups and everything. And, and he was just amazed of their faith. They, they were just worshipping out loud. They were um, praying constantly. It was full of joy. It's like they had everything that he had in his head was in their hearts. Um, but then he got back to England after this mission trip and uh, Georgia, which is um, uh, east from where I am. It's not too far. Um, 
got back, he was just distraught. He was questioning everything about who he was. And there's that thing that we always celebrate in the Methodist church. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of, yeah, you know, we have this oldest gate day and they talk about it heaps. I think it's good to remember, but um, uh, on the 24th of May, 1738, it was in Aldersgate Street in London. I'm, I went there once. It's not really there anymore. And uh, it was at his low point. He heard, uh, he heard Preface to Romans. It was written by um, Luther. And then his heart was warmed. That was, um, so remember this guy was something where he just kept, he knew it all and said, he was an Oxford guy, right? But then his heart just went on fire. Then he went crazy. This guy was just insane. He was so loyal to the Anglican church that he wanted to revive the Anglican church and he saw all the needs. And he said, he was basically saying, Lord, I really want to know you. I'm not going to, uh, you know, come, come on, come into, just revive my heart, Lord. And um, I'm just going to go. I'm going to go into that lane. I'm not going to get out of it anymore. And he, he just went for it. So when he got lit on fire, he went out there and a movement started. Because of his leadership skills, his administration gifts, um, his just crazy work ethic, to the compromise of his family, by the way, he suffered math. He didn't really. He was married, but the wife never saw him. It was a terrible marriage. So don't look at him for, um, you know, family counselling or anything. Um, but he just went insane. He was so loyal to the Anglican Church that he didn't want to set up set up another church. He was like, this is a movement to revive the Anglican Church. It was a revivalist movement. Um, but they didn't endorse him. They rejected him from breaking rules uh, because he preached outside the church. Back then they said, you can only preach inside the church. Why are you letting women teach? You're not allowed to get women to teach. That's wrong. And um, you can't pick lay people to do stuff. Only clergy can do it. It's getting, you know, they're kind of getting a little bit too focused on head knowledge, the Anglican church at the time. So the movement took off because people that never heard the gospel were just getting it in like normal speak. And they were coming, the church was going to them. It was going out of the um, church walls. And then it just went crazy and it took off. He, he was so good at delegating as well, Wesley. He, he, this is where the Asbury thing came I was telling you about. It was like, there's this new land in America and it's going, it looks like it's fertile land for the gospel. Who's willing to go? It's like the Lord of Rings fellowship of the ring moment. And then he's in, well, John Wesley's there hoping some of his, um, you know, his other beastie circuit rider guys would say, yeah, we'll do it. And he goes, who's going to do it? And no one wants to do it. Then this little young kid in the corner called Francis Asbury goes, oh, I'll do it. He can't, he can't preach or anything, though. And they're like, oh, great. So they lay hands on him, kind of like Fellowship of the Ring stuff, literally, like Frodo and stuff. And then this kid just goes up straight up to um, uh, America. And he's, Francis Asbury just rides crazy amount of time. But anyway, we're not focusing about him. Um, and then not only the faith started, the revival of the church started, but then you saw all these, um, all this expressing your faith outwards, like um, abolishment of slavery came out of it. Um, um, the first things around women and uh, giving rights to them, um, getting up, getting, uh, uh, setting up uh, orphanages. Oh, that's why there's so many like orphanages and schools. And there's a bunch of like Malaysian guys here, you know, everywhere he goes like, oh, Methodist secular or whatever. You know, there's Methodist schools, there's just hospitals, all that stuff everywhere. Because they, they were setting up very practical expressions of their faith. But because he was so, he didn't want to go against the um, Anglican church. He never said that he was or anything. It was just like some minister dude, which is why today, they, even in Britain Methodism today, they just have this thing called superintendents. They refuse to call them bishops. Let's call it superintendent. But then the American version, like when Raspberry went over there, they said after the, they had a civil war here in America and um, a lot of the Methodists were on the, like the guys that were like, um, what do you call them? Abolitionists, they were anti-Britain. But when that happened, they was like, oh, stuff England, the motherland. Well, this is gonna be our religion. We're gonna have our own bishops. So. Um, uh, we're kind of weird in Chinese Methodists. We've got both. So um, we're kind of like in the middle. But it goes to show. That's why you're probably wondering, oh, that's such a weird name. Why are they called them superintendents? 
Uh, what is this bishop thing? It's that's where it comes from. To show you how beastie this Wesley guy was, we do not idolize Wesley at all. Remember, he was only one piece of the puzzle in the journey that God was doing to bring the king. Um, you know, really demonstrate um, Thy kingdom come that we say all the time. He preached forty thousand sermons. So imagine you after you graduate. Let's say you you went to school, graduated from a well, you went to Oxford or whatever, and uh, you graduate in like 20, 20 odd. Imagine for the next 110 years, every day of your life, you preached. That's basically what 40,000 sermons is. He didn't have a car back then. There was no airlines. He rode on a horse, 400,000 Ks. That's going around the world 10 times on a horse. He... He had all these, I don't know how he mentored all these like people under him to start this parish church orc. Um, got no idea. He was into, he, he wrote so many different things. It was like Luther, right? Like Calvin, all these mighty men of God in the past um, and changed the world. And because of that, um, Great Awakening was birthed in the USA, like with the Puritans and John, um, uh, Jonathan Edwards and whatnot. Um, in conjunction with them and generations were saved and stirred um, through these movements so this is what it means going back to the question Chinese Methodist what's Methodist that's what Methodist means we're not an institution we're not just a building we're not um, let's go AMYC in December each year we're not you know um, seeing doxology, threefold amen. That's not Methodist. There were tiny little bits of it, but really that heritage, that wonder, it was a revival movement. And we don't idolise it. There was great moves of God that Wesley was only one pick of the puzzle and he stood on the shoulders of others before him. But God used... There was an acceleration and an intensification of God's work at that time because there was obedience. And, um, and he didn't do it for self-adulation or pride because the agreement grows, grew so fast. It required structure, yet it required flexibility. It needed freedom, yet accountability. And it was, just, it was just such a blessing that we really feel to this time today. It changed England. It rescued England. And its legacy, even through the Methodist movement, laid birth to the um, uh, holiness movement. And then the Pentecostal movement came out of that. Uh, under as a successor, later later successor to the Wesleyan heritage. Takeaways. This is the first lecture, the big one. Uh, next part's a little bit quicker. Wesleyans were a product of the Protestant Reformation, birthed as a revival movement through the Anglican tradition. Okay, you need to remember that. Um, birthed through the Anglican tradition. Where very, the Wesleyans are birthed in the middle of Catholicism and, and, and Protestantism. And uh, uh, the Pietists and Wesley, um, they brought about Reformation, not Reformation like doctrines and, and, and institution wise, like Luther and Calvin, but rather they, they didn't focus on the external features. Rather, they really focused on Reformation or revival in the heart in the souls, in behaviours, in conduct, in faith. Using the house analogy, um, the framework was like reformed, it was built. They, they did the bulldozing, knocked a dem demolition job with Luther and Calvin and all that, and then the interior fittings, making it livable. And the house was, was the pietists in Wesley. The second point, we need to recognise that we are all one body. Despite differences of opinion in the broader um, Protestant church, um, there's, there'll always be opinions amongst people because we're all different, we're all unique people. Um, but the most important thing is not looking at the difference, it's looking at the heart of the Christian faith. What is the heart? The heart is the truth that Jesus is the Christ, he is the Son of God, that he was crucified, rose from the dead, uh, ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. Sounds like the Apostles' Creed, doesn't it? And it's very important whilst I'm on this point. Um, liturgy is important at times because liturgy, is one of those rare things that unites all these denominations because they celebrate what brings them together rather than what differs them. So I know a lot of us might be really anti-liturgy, 
but sometimes things like the Apostles' Creed, they are, that, that is so old. It is a treasure. It is like agreed on across all groups. Um, and that we need to focus on things like that. Say our liturgy. It's like our family creed, basically. It's the Apostles' Creed. Um, it binds us together. Uh, Paul's favorite metaphor is that we are the body of Christ, that each individual believer is a member of that body. Each member has its own function to perform. Not all of us is the same thing as others, and no task is any less than the other. And with every part of the body um, doing what it's created to actually do, all members of the body we benefit. By embracing our diversity in the body, we see unity. Yeah, so that's a super important point to make. This is not about saying Lutheran's better, Catholic, Anglican, none about that. It's we are all one body if we all utter the same creed. Yeah, there's going to be differences um, and different expressions, but we need to recognise, take that Paul metaphor of the body. Third point, we are a relay race of generations that press into the promises of God. Further to the point of unity, it's so easy to think of us today, and that's it. Forget everyone else in history. It's easy to see uh, breakdowns and errors in people in the past rather than their, their pros. It's easy to look at um, everything that they did wrong rather than what they did right. But what we need to do is remember that we are only part of the relay, that there are people before us that have paved the way, that are, there are like, like John the Baptist, the preparation going on by generations before us to set up the conditions for Reformation revival because God's kingdom, thy kingdom come. Um, it's not Luther we celebrate. It is, it, um, he was a catalyst. It is not Zwingli or Calvin we celebrate. They were, they were instigators. It's not um, Thomas Cranmer and Anglican Church where hell. They were agents. It's not Wesley we idolized. He was merely a spark. That the person that started this race was God. He is continually ahead of all of us, working to reconcile us back to him. He prepared the racetracks, he made the stadium, and then he said, he, 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 God incarnate came down, Jesus Christ, God man, and he had started the race with this baton, and he's already won, and he's passing it to generations. And we have the duty to run our leg of the race as hard as we can, clasping onto the promises of God, knowing that he will renew and restore creation, that the battle or the race is not yours. I'm taking 2 Chronicles 2015 here. The battle is not yours, but it's God's, right? So we need to really remember that, that of the generation before us. And, and we pray it all the time when we go through the Apostles' Creed about the saints, because we are part of the family of the saints. So there you go. First mini lecture done. Oh, covered off a few hundred years of, I had to take a whole semester to do that, man. So I crammed it all in. Uh, there you go. Front of saliva. I'll do a quick, quick drink of coffee. Um, I forgot what time we got to. Is it like 8.30, right? Okay, so don't have too much time. Might skip a little bit. but Let's go around what Wesleyans believe. Okay, so. Sorry, I usually take questions, but let's pass for a little bit. I'll just pause, 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 pause. Remember, where's... Next part, mini lecture, understanding Wesleyan theology. Oh, can't talk, talk this, past with, this fast with Americans, mate. Actually, I need to side note just for my own enjoyment. <laughs> like when I hear Australians say my name, like Rob, um, actually, I'm already sounding a bit American. Rob, it, like back home, it's like got a nice O sound. It's very fast, like nanosecond to say. And then when you say my name here, because I'm in the South, like Bible Belt, and when I get on the phone all the time, what's your name? I go, Rob. And they say, what? <laughs> oh, Rob. <laughs> it takes three seconds to say my name, even though it's only three letters. So it's hilarious. So it's not really like a O sound. It's like a nasal A, like Rob. Anyway, I had to just throw in some humour there. <laughs> Let's get into Wesley. What do, we, what does, what do Wesleyans believe? Um, and going through that history, it does make you really appreciate the, what people have done in the past day eh? and um, really affirms what the expression of revival. So Wesleyan theology believed in the five solas. It was like kind of product also of the Reformation. So um, those five solas I was talking about, sola scriptura, scriptura alone, sola fide, faith alone, soli gratia, grace alone, fourth one, sola Christus, through Christ alone, fifth one, uh, soli deo gloria, glory to God alone. So they, without a doubt, hold on to that because they were product of that. But Wesley had accents. 
on certain pieces of that puzzle, like all the others. First and foremost, first and foremost, I said this before, Wesleyans are from the Anglican tradition, which are really heirs to both Protestant Reformation and heirs to Catholicism. Remember, Anglicanism was the middle ground. So let's go through those five solas from a Wesleyan perspective. Sola Scriptura. Firstly, Wesley agreed that Scripture is the highest authority, without a doubt. Uh, there's this famous theologian, he's died now, Albert Utler. However, he described that there's also accents that Wesley added to this, what he called the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Scripture is the authority, trumps everything. But as close runners up, when cannot throw away, he had three other things to make this quadrilateral. Remember our maths quadrilateral is four sides. We can't forget tradition. So the people before us and what's happened because God's moved through that. Our own experiences in our heart. Third one. So that's the pietistic influence and reason, our mind. So very much like what the orthodox Lutherans and all that and we're getting into, the very doctrinal, rational, philosophical thought. Remember, super important to note, it is not an equilateral. It's not equal. It is a quadrilateral. Scripture trumps all of them. It's the utmost authority. But it isn't alone because it's got these close subordinates. Like the Orthodox and the Catholics, we are supposed to embrace tradition. Like the Pietists, we express, we embrace experience. Like the Reformed tradition of those Orthodox sides, we embrace the reason. Very important to note this. There's a difference. Now, more so, Wesley also believed, like the Pietists, because remember, he was also a product of the Pietist trends that was going on, the, the second Reformation 2.0, that the Word of God is not static, like what a lot of the Orthodox got to, but it was a means of grace, that it's living, that it's dynamic, that the big emphasis on the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit works through Scripture to awaken us to our salvation, not, not a static truth for who Jesus was or did, but that Jesus is present now, that he is calling us through the Word of God now, through the Holy Spirit, that through the Holy Spirit, um, the Scripture calls us by name. So, yes, it is doctrine, but it is also a means of grace, so the Scriptura, okay? Super important one to name first and foremost. Align to Reformation principles, but accents on scripture, tradition, and reason. Um, um, so, sorry, uh, tradition, experience, and uh, reason. So, remembering that again, we are that in the middle between Protestantism and Catholicism. That's the tradition it came out of. We're not like them, but with us, tradition we came from. Next one, sole fide by faith alone. Before I talk about this, let's remember Romans 4. Romans 4, 4 to 5. It says that, and I'm going to quote NIV here. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. So unlike the pre-Reformation times when it was corrupt, no works of righteousness, no simony, can justify us. Only faith and faith alone. It means that it is not for the righteous, but for the sinner. Sanctification follows righteousness, though. What is sanctification? It's like the process of being more holy. Holiness follows righteousness. Holy works, though, really important. Works cannot precede righteousness. Holy works follow righteousness. This is that pietist type thought coming through that he was influenced by. Wesley. But what this is the again the difference here to Sole Fide. Wesley added his accent to this, yes, by faith alone. But he says, saving faith, he says, is not alone and static and apathetic, as what you were reading James 2. It says that faith without works is dead. 
faith yes it is it is it is the it's by faith alone that we are saved but faith without works is dead and true faith gives birth to holy works not holy works giving birth not the other way around but faith gives birth to holy works in other words good works are the fruit of our justification it is the the fruit grows from this tree of faith uh, the fruit of holy works that we have dynamic and living faith that is active and not an apathetic faith so he stressed that he was very had a strong accent on that and um like the uh catholics and the pietists there was emphasis on yes justification by faith on one side of the coin but also sanctification as well that we are to continually look work to be um, um not because we are not saved but we express it. We want, to, we want to be more holy, that we are justified by faith. A product of our faith is works. Also for Wesleyans, it must be stressed that um, faith is not simply an intellectual activity, believing in our doctrines, um, that it wasn't just about going through a baptism, uh, the physical ritual of it. Faith is, is not ritualistic either. Faith is much more than what we believe in our minds. There was also a deep personal trust in our hearts that we affirm that we are saved by faith, but also trust Jesus with the whole of our lives. When I go out um, uh, to, uh, there's a statue there. Uh, one of the statues there is that of Wesley. And it's the plaque there that describes Wesley as having the ox of mind and an older's gate heart. I love that. Yeah, the rational intellect here but he also had the oldest gate heart the joining of that charles wesley his brother he was like the you know like the um you know, he's the super worship leaders nowadays he was like the the worship leader back then he wrote a famous hymn that says the lyrics go unite the pair head and heart unite the pair so long disjoined knowledge and vital piety Learning and holiness combined, truth and love, let all men see. So it wasn't for themselves to join this, but for the world to see. Next one, sola gratia. We are saved by the grace of God alone, not saved by human effort or works. Okay, remember, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It means that sinners are forgiven out of the great mercy of God, not condemnation, but a gift, a gift free of salvation through Jesus Christ. But again, Wesley adds an accent. Yes, we are saved, but grace cannot be seen as a license for indulgences, but relative to the law. He was worried that it will be understood in this way. Whilst Luther states that the law he says that the law points us to Christ. Luther said that the law points us to Christ. Wesley agreed with what Luther said. The law points us to Christ. But then he also said that once the law points us to Christ, then Christ points us to the law. Not in to be so um, uh, you know, rigorous about it, but so that it will illuminate our souls because the law is written on our hearts so that we know the express will of God. Next one, sola Christus, Christ alone. We come to salvation only through Jesus as our mediator between God and humanity. We all get that. We read in Hebrews and Acts 4 as well. And 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. It, it, this sounds exclusive in today's society, unfortunately. But it is so... It's like that because humanity, we're, we're part of the problem. That's why it sounds exclusive. Only God can solve this. Only someone that can bridge the, um, the, the gap that is created between um, a man and God. So a God-man, the incarnate Jesus Christ. Only he can reconcile us. God must come, the Emmanuel. But what Wesley adds is that it is not Christ alone involved in this. But what Wesley adds is that it is the whole Trinity. Remember, it is God the Father who gives the gift of his Son. Romans 3, 24 to 25, all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. 
God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. More so, the Holy Spirit administers the graces of redemption by bearing witness to the Son. So salvation, Wesley stressed that salvation is Trinitarian. It is from the Father, through the Son, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And finally, uh, the last, act, the last part was Dato Sol, Solia Gloria. Um, no accent here, but that we have all been created to love, uh, to know love and to enjoy God forever. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 31. So that whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Like my, um, my, my favorite verse, Colossians 3 23, everything you do, do it as if you're doing it for the Lord, not for men. Not our glory, but God's glory, not our worship or our status, but for God's glory alone. Okay, end of the second mini, mini lecture. Takeaway points for this. First point, Wesleyan quadrilateral. Wesleyans believe in this. Yes, they believe in the sole authority of scripture. That is the ultimate authority, trumps everything. But second to that, Wesleyans also believe in the validity of tradition, reason, and experience in the heart. They don't trump it. I need to reinforce that. They don't trump scripture. Scripture stands above all of them. But... Um, they are in that quadrilateral, not the equilateral because they're not equal, in that quadrilateral that Albert Outlet noted as the Wesleyan quadrilateral, okay? Next one. We need to have an Oxford mind and an Aldersgate heart. Like the Pietists, the second, the 2.0 Reformation, the Wesleyans believed in the importance of incarceration of the heart. Um, uh, in other words, installing, instilling everything that we know of Christian into our hearts like the Protestants, they believed in the importance of the belief of doctrines in our minds. We need to get a good understanding of who we know in our minds. But thus the joining of Oxford mind and Aldersgate heart to emphasise not just the exterior, but the interior. That is why baptism amongst Wesleyans, it is a sign of the work the Lord has done. Um, it is a public profession. If you go to the Lutheran church and the Catholic church, it is essential to your salvation to get physically baptised. For um, uh, for the Wesleyans, the inner being was of even more importance than the physical act. They still feel it is important as the sign is a public profession, but the inner being was more important. Third point. This one, it can get controversial sometimes because you need to be, we need to be very delicate about it. It's that very important. Like it's like, you know, when you're, this COVID stuff going on, you need to be very aware of what your temperature is. But that temperature range is so, like, we need to be on that precipice, right? You don't want to be too much or too little. Similar to this, we need to be very balanced in this. It's that right, right pressure point. By faith alone, we yes, yes. But faith without works is dead. Whilst Wesleyans agree that faith alone is of the utmost importance for justification, they believe equally that there's an ongoing sanctification that is demonstrated through our works. Remember, I say this all the time, it's like a broken record, not works to achieve salvation, but our faith is expressed through works. That it was not enough to merely just say, I believe, and that's it, and be physically baptised and you're done. Uh, but there needs to be an actual change in our attitudes, in our posture, in our expression to society. More like the pietists, um, that we are justified to be sanctified. I like to think of it like this analogy, right? So Ruth and I, we've been married for um, 13, 14 years now, right? Cr cracking into it. Not like you young pups. Um, and it's been a joyous time. But then that anyone that says that, um, that I married my wife um, on July 10th in 2006, that I married my wife then, right? It's technically, yes, I'm married. I've got a certificate that has my date of marriage. Um, we had a ceremony, we had heaps of people there. I was, um, we're physically together from that point. It's the commencement, though, of our life of marriage. The true expression of my marriage, though, is to live out my marriage through love and actions to her. Now, it'll, it'll be a terrible marriage if I said, hey, we're married now, we've got the cert, done. And then we just go about doing whatever we want. No, but we, marriage is hard work. It's, yeah, there's beautiful times, there's such intimate times, there's such strong joy, but there's also frustration as we're having to learn to live with each other and we can't be selfish and we learn about being selfless. So, but then we learn, even though we are called married technically, 
but we're actually learning to be married every day. The true expression of my marriage is to live it through my actions, my, through my emotions for her, not just legally on a piece of paper, but expressed through everything that I do and in my thoughts and within my heart. So that's the difference there. Cool. End of the second uh, mini lecture. Um, and I'll leave a bit of time for questions. So we're going to rise through the last part. Um, please pause your questions. I think we've only got 25 minutes left. Couldn't, that's good. We're making our way through three um, mini lectures. This one now will be a little bit more sermon-like, okay? Kind of, sort of. But why we need a Wesleyan-like revival today. Uh, I think I'm a better word than Wesleyan because I don't like to idolise the dude. But, um, but it follows similar themes. That's why I want to use it. All that description that Charles Dickens placed about the time when Wesley was around doesn't take too much to think about the similarities between the times of England in the 1700s and today. They were going through plague, COVID-19 now. They were going through smallpox, massive, killing thousands of people. It was disrupting society. Churches were established, yet they were losing relevance due to not being, you know, society didn't really care about them. There was some controversy coming out there. We were having like child abuse things coming up with Catholic Church. There's, there's every day you seem to look at the church and there's like um, uh, huge like um, celebrity-like Christian leaders falling from grace. Um, there's, um, and it's losing, the church is losing credibility. Even here in the Bible Belt, where I'm, there's, there was addictions at that time. Gin was going rampant because it was cheap. We've got like ice and, um, and meth and all kinds of things, alcohol, things that they're talking about legalizing some of this stuff. It's insane, right? Crimes prevalent uh, because there was just this massive disparity between the rich and the like today. Like COVID-19 here in the States, it's actually demonstrating that there's, it's actually making the richer richer and the poorer, poorer. Like, um, I forgot that I've gone, gone blank. The guy that owns uh, Amazon, is it Bezos? I can't remember. So I think it's Bezos. Getting insanely rich. And um, all the hedge fund guys getting insanely rich. The poor are just getting poorer. They have a little check in the mail. Here's your little incentive check or whatever. But they're getting, they're, they've got the same costs. There is growing detachment with the term Christian and what true heart Christianity is. I think last time I checked, I don't know what uh, census, this, every four years, I can't remember. But I think in the last census in Australia, 2016, it said that 52% um, of Australians were under the Christian tradition, like Protestant, Catholic, independent. No way is that reflected in society, right? Just look at the pews. Might be Christian by name, but definitely not by deed. Um, instead of immoral laws like slavery that we have, that they had back then. We've got super progressive laws being pushed further and forth. They're testing the boundaries of our humanity. We're kind of like um, making our own Frankenstein. We're not scared of Frankenstein anymore. We want to test our limits. Um, yet, where is, yet where is the Christian voice? Where is those bold people like Luther? Um, there was an industrial revolution going on right then. Society is changing rapidly because the industrialization that was going on. Now we've got the We've got the digital age, the informational age, which is going on. It is insane. Um, things are changing everywhere. Everything's on our phone. That, that iPhone's not that old. It's so rapid how much society is changing and being morphed by technology and digital enhancements. And so what does the church do then? Like back then, we love debating ideology. We'll have a go at someone for slightly different ideas. We don't live actual Christian living in our heart. I put my hand up. We're not living very piously. We're so scared of it, like faith by works, right? That, so scared of that stuff that, um, that you even get hyper grace that comes out of this, right? It's no good. We are at the precipice of a society that mirrors the time that Wesley was in. Add fuel to that, we are Christians have, have so little understanding of who we are, let alone appreciation of one another. We're making our own castles in today's age, not realising that foundations of castles were made in yesteryear, and we're trying to make it our own. Like, 
we're redoing work that has been done by the saints before us. We're not even acknowledging things that we can learn from that can be applicable for us today because just some repeat. But because we're too busy attacking each other and working together, we've become political. Knowledge is power or information is power and that's expediated by the internet. Works of mercy are belittled as people strive for power. It's the same idols all the time. Power, sex and money. They plagued humanity throughout history. Even in the church, bigger is better. Pastor's legacy, reputation is more important than works of piety in the life of the church. We've become commercial entities striving for numbers and metrics like Wall Street corporations. And that is why we need a Wesleyan-like revival into the heart. Jonathan Edwards um, I know um, one of the pastors in CMCA, uh, Ricky, um, it's down in Melbourne, Ricky Nichotto. He, I know he's, I think he's doing his dissertation on Jonathan Edwards, but Prince of Puritans, they call him. Uh, he was one of the catalysts of the Great Awakening. He's got his memoirs and he describes, he defines revival. He defines revival. I love this quote, capture it, as an acceleration and the intensification of the normal work of the Holy Spirit it is the acceleration and the intensification of the normal work of the Holy Spirit. And he called for the church at that time to have increased affections away from the head and into the heart. Um, or as Charles Wesley sang, as I told you, that lyric he sang, unite the pair so long destroying knowledge and vital piety, learning and holiness combined and truth and love. Let all man that all humanity see. That is what we need today. An acceleration and an intensification of the normal work of the Holy Spirit because there's so much garbage and junk and muck that we're in now and mire that we're in, and we need our generation to be awakened. All of us, uh, you are all leaders of, from the Wesleyan tradition. If you're with the Wesleyan church now or not, doesn't matter. It's not an institution. It's in your heart. We need a generation awakened to know Jesus, not just in their heads and knowledge, but in their hearts. It's not that far a distance, but we, it's so hard. It's taken many, many generations to draw on that. We need to bridge that. And as I was reflecting on what we need to hear about revivals as emerging leaders with a Wesleyan tradition, not just here as Chinese Methodist church, but globally, I want to encourage us the three principles of revival. First of all, big one, revivals are preceded by prayer. Unfortunately, today, um, one of my, the prayer meeting is left behind. I love that quote by Leonard, Leonard Ravenhill as revivalist here. The, the prayer meeting is the Cinderella of the church today. He wrote that back in the 1900s. And that, what has changed? The same. Service numbers, capture it. Prayer meeting numbers, don't bother about it. It's just this afterthought. Our focus is on the public pulpit. It's not on the private parts that we go to to call out to the Lord. Our focus is on communication, but not to God. It's to ourselves and to others to look at programs, structures, making things bigger and better, deceiving ourselves that this thing that we have made is revival. In Acts, Jesus, when he was about to send, he told his disciples to stay and await the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So what do the people do? They don't go manufacturing it. What do they do? They go in Acts 1.14, they go to pray. It says that they prayed in one accord. The word pray here is prosepkumai in Greek. Prosepkumai is, um, they have great, English is just such a, uh, it's not a great language to describe the nuances of our faith. But prosepkumai in Greek, it's a verb that is, um, that it's, you know, like when there's different verbs, we'll go back to your grammar, there's like, when you throw the ball, um, you're, you're active. When you catch the ball, you're passive. Like there's active and passive. This prosepkuma is a middle verb. It's 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 um it's neither this or that. It doesn't start it. It also doesn't receive it. It does both. So prosepkuma is like we are crying out to God, but in the process of crying out to God, there's like this two way exchange that happens. It is it is a middle verb. No, so it's very important to note that. But also note that they didn't just pray. They prayed in one accord. This is Greek word that is. Omosodon, the same word used in Romans 15, 6, that states that we may be with one mind and one mouth to glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Another way is to say that we are united, that we are linked with our passions, unanimous, not this disparity, we're unanimous. Like we're singing in a choir. When you hear that one, have you heard sing those choirs before and you got one, one, one person out of tune, mate, just the other rest, doesn't matter what the rest of them do, sound great, right? that one person can turn it off for everyone else. His calling for people in Acts 1, 4, that they prayed in one accord. Pray in one accord. Wesley's prayer bench um, was so used that he had grooves bent into the wood. Uh, he would wake up at 4 a.m. every day, pray for four hours each day. His famous quote, God does nothing but by prayer and everything with it. Even when he was an old fella, he got down eight hours, I think it was, something crazy like that. Every day, he went, when he needed God more, he prayed more. But we've, we've just so, we've just lost, lost that, haven't we? The second thing about revivals is that they require piety. An unfortunate outcome of our society is people believe that as Christians, uh, after we're baptised, that's about it. Go about living life relatively unchanged. We, we unfortunately um, misinterpret what Luther had intended. Okay? We misinterpret it. But as Jesus said, salt without saltiness is useless. Imagine chucking salt on to a dish and it's got no saltiness for you master chefs out there. What's the point of that? It's like white rocks that do nothing. Um, Matthew 5.13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot, trampled. We are seeing an unsalt unsalty church that has lost the very essence of what it has made, what has made it different to the rest of the world. Salt is a preservative. The preserving power like salt of the gospel, when you put on a wound, salt stings, but it actually heals the dirtiness of the wound. And notice that Jesus uses the analogy of salt when he's going through after the Beatitudes, which means the blessings. Remember that part where he talks, blessed are this, blessed are that. For those that live a pious life in that blessing, it's like um, they are being salt. It stings like an antiseptic, but it cleanses the dirty wounds. Another word for this process of being um, holy is to be made holy, to be sanctified. Um, I, I want to do a little bit of exegete really quick, if I may. Let's check the time, maybe. or well, maybe not. I'll pass on that. Okay, let's, let's pass on that. I don't think we've got too much time left. Last one. Third thing is revival requires action. Okay? Imagine this. Let's imagine go back to Aldersgate situation where it's like, oh, yes, God, warming in the heart. All right, now I'm just going to pray. Lord, make it happen. Lord, come on. Come on, Lord. Come on, Lord. He didn't just sit there and just, yes, Lord, come on. He just, he did just sit. Come on, reform it, Lord. He didn't just sit there and pontificate. Revivals need action. I'm not suggesting that we manufacture things by hands, but what we see is that when the spirit moves through people's history, they act with immediacy, with the gifts that God has bestowed upon them, okay? Immediately when Acts after the Pentecost happened, the people spoke straight away. They were speaking of the glories of God immediately. And people go, no, these guys are drunk. In Acts 4, there was this part where Peter and John they were before the Sanhedrin, like the council, right, of all these Jewish leaders. And they were, they were threatening them with persecution. And instead of going away and going, oh, we won't do it again. And instead of going away and praying, oh, Lord, knock them out with lightning, they'd go away. What do they do? In Acts 4.24, they go away and they get together with other people and they pray with their voices together, um, together that word again, together in unison, for boldness. They're crazy. They pray for a word boldness to be more active. They wanted to act. They didn't want to wait on God to do stuff. They're willing to be, important word here, to be his instruments, to be jars of clay. Again, when Paul was converted onto the Damascus Road, um, he got blinded and stuff. And then um, God, God tells Ananias, this, this bloke, to go over to Paul and says, go over to Paul and because he is my chosen instrument. An instrument. An instrument is we're used by God to be led to do his work, an instrument like a violin or a piano, that we use them to make things. What does Paul do soon after he is healed from blindness and encounters Jesus on the Damascus Road? He goes to get baptized, proclaims that Jesus is his Lord, so he rededicates himself, and then he goes to see the um, other disciples, and in 920, 
Acts 9.20, he, they use the word, immediately proclaims Jesus. This guy was persecuting Christians. He immediately goes to the synagogue where people know him as a persecutor of Christians. All these dudes, they revere him because he's persecuting Christians. They love this bloke as a persecutor of the Christians, these Jew, the, the Jewish people. And he goes into this place where lots of people are Jewish, publicly professes that Jesus is the Lord. What on earth is he doing? This guy acts on immediacy. He does not hesitate. He doesn't pray for lightning to strike on people so they believe in Jesus. He is a willing instrument and he's not passive, he is active. In Romans 8, 14, it says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Well, I've got four kids. I'm not, that's it, I'm not having any more. Uh, but an analogy of children. If you want your children to, um, you want to lead your children to follow you and they submit, we don't follow the children, they follow us. They submit to us in humility, right? And we, need, we are like obedient children. We need to do the same. We are led by our parent, which is inspired through us, through the spirit of God, uh, the breath of Jesus. Uh, as, and then we are thus children of God, Romans 8, 14. So remember, revivals are not a new idea. We've seen them in the Reformation. We've seen them through the Wesleyan revivals. We've seen them coming back to the Pentecostal movement in the Zuzu Street revivals in California in the 900s. But it's, We've seen it in the Bible over and over again. And we need a new revival starting with us. Don't be passive about it. God asks us to be his kindling for revival fire. We might be the kindling. We might be the bigger planks. We might even be the spark. But it's not our fire. It is God's revival fire. We are part of that race, the stadium that God has made. Jesus came down. God, man, starting this race which has been won. People have sprinted their lives out for the gospel, the platforms that we have today. We are standing on their shoulders as the generations. We do not reinvent. We keep going. We sprint as hard as we can. And we go for it because revival is in our hearts. That's where it starts. And we need to rededicate ourselves on our knees, not manufactured, but abiding in the Lord so that he may be and use us as his instrument for his kingdom to come. So remember your heritage. Remember who you are, not as Wesleyans, but we take the Lutheran tradition, the Wesleyan tradition, the Cranmer tradition, the Acts tradition, Jesus, Jesus encompasses all of them. And we stand on that generation of shoulders of giants before us to be there, to see his kingdom come for the generations after us, to prepare the way. There we go. Yeah, when people talk about like all the corruption and bad things that go in the church, like, is it ever a helpful thing to say like maybe those people who do those things are like not genuinely christian because i feel like there could be some problem with that like even just looking at the methodist movement from a non-christian point of view they could attack like martin luther for his anti-semitic like things and also john wesley for i guess like this messed up marriage so like how would you respond to it when yeah yeah that's a good point i think it's really important to um we can never judge other people i think that's the most important thing because we're uh, you know cool way to we've got the plank in our own eye we don't want to um you know, you know that's plank in our own eye and people got a speck in their eye right so that analogy that's given to us so i think we need to be very very conscious not to be because when we do that we might look self-righteous an important thing to do in that moment is to realise that it's not us that can do anything. All we can do, though, uh, is preach the word and the truth. Preach the word and truth and pray that the Holy Spirit will open the hearts of those people. Now, clearly, if you see corruption, which I don't really think we have, right, in um, lots of the, not to that same degree, um, God's not calling us to be superheroes to just change something that's, doesn't need fixing too dramatically right there's a human side that we can fix but there's other side that only god can fix it within people's hearts and we all need fixing so i think the important thing is to if you encounter situations like that be willing to draw on scripture but don't do it in a way that's judgmental and um recognizing that we are all we will all look hypocritical if we do that but rather um coming in a way of um humility and love and and just preaching the truth uh and praying that whatever essence of uh fire that can be sparked through that comes yeah so the most born word be aware of your instrument likeness 
Yeah, because like I'm just following on from that. Like, what happens like if, like, how should I respond if they try to say like invalidate like the Methodist movement because of like all those deep issues with Martin Luther and John Wesley and people like that? Yeah. Um, so you're talking about people that will say, oh, like from other denominations talking about other denominations. Um, it could be them or non Christians or just just anyone else in general. Yeah, I think what it, because there's so much focus on um, what divides people now rather than what unites people. It's really a perspective issue. Um, and that's so accentuated in today's society. I think you need to, in those instances, don't focus on differences, remind people what are the similarities that we share. So again, Apostles' Creed is a great one. Like we all agree on some of those fundamental doctrines of truth. Um, there's there's way, way more, like if you have to measure it between Luther and Calvin, I think, you, you know, I'll just throw a number, 95% of what Luther and Zwingli had was the same, but that 5% caused differences, yeah? And um, unfortunately, we're the same. Um, in, and look, in the political situation here in the States, it's um, with oh, Republicans and Democrats, the same thing. Everyone focuses on what divides us rather than what, what unites us. And we need, to, we need to be those guys that remind us of the unity that exists within the church. And there'll be lots of people outside the church to try to tear the church down by saying that we're divided. And unfortunately, we do act divided. Uh, so we should be agents that, that demonstrate what unifies us. Henry, can I just add to you, um, I appeal to the story of um, Paul and Barnabas in the Bible. As you know, uh, they had a sharp disagreement and they went their separate ways in the book of Acts um, because um, Paul didn't want to take Mark on his secondary, his secondary missionary journey, I think. Uh, but Barnabas did. And unfortunately, because of that disagreement, um, they split ways. But even though Paul and Barnabas split ways, God could still use that split to bring the gospel to another person another um another town another city you know in another world but when you look at why they disagreed pay attention to why they disagreed they didn't disagree on doctrine it wasn't because of doctrine it wasn't because paul and barnabas dis disagreed on on certain doctrines that they split no they split because of personal opinions of whether we should take mark one one wants to take mark the other one does not that's i think that's very important because they didn't disagree on doctrines, but what they did disagree on was their personal opinions of Mark. Right. Not on doctrines. Okay, I think we're going to go back to Rob. There's some more questions coming in. Yeah, that, cool. Let's do it. Uh, that was good. Um, I agree with that, Albert. That was a good illustration. Um, uh, do you have helpful ways of explaining what the heart of piety? So think of it as um, um, affections with our hearts. There's also... Um, a, a, uh, that Wesley calls it circumcision of the heart. I really think it's just that joining and making sure that what we believe is actually within our hearts and expressed through actions. There's also that, there's also that um, uh, uh, works of piety you might have heard. So we need to, sometimes we pray about stuff or we don't do it. And one really important thing, I think the word prayer is just an English word of prayer. is just no good. Like it's so too limited. But when you look at the Greek word of prayer, I think that's why God made um, Greek the language of the time when the NTT was being orchestrated. Uh, it's, it's made up of actually two words, um, pro, sepkumai. Um, pro, we have still have the word pro today, like professional, pro this. Um, pro means go towards, go towards. And then the sepkumai, the second part of the word of prayer, means um, to make a vow, like in marriage. So when it says go towards making a vow, that's like, like what the word Greek word of prayer means, prosepkumai. Um, you know that that Bible verse where it says pray ceaselessly. I think it's uh, Thessalonians. Um, I always wondered, does that mean we just be on our knees twenty four hours a day, or like um, international house prayer and all that stuff? No, not necessarily. I think it, what it does mean. I think that's a good move, by the way. But I think what it, what it means is that prayer is not is is not just passive, like we're just lifting it up to the Lord, but it's also active in that we we make a vow. Like when I get married, I get married, I make a vow, but I live it. So when we pray, Prasepkumai, 
we we are praying to the Lord and then we might be prompted by the spirit around certain things. It doesn't mean we just sit passively and think, oh yeah, I'm praying for a revival. Come on, bring revival. We need to start acting like revival as well. That's what praying ceaselessly because cease praying is an action that is, that is, you know, outwards as well. So just remember that. Um, I think that's very important in terms of piety. I think there was another one there from, great one from Esther. How do we balance honouring our mother's heritage by allowing the current gender to take ownership and remain in the church to grow without forcing the stay within this domination? Stuff it. I'm going to say something controversial.